Hello, I'm Bridget Dune, and I have read the first two of four novellas in my ebook, Erotica for the Refined Palette. So today I'm starting the third novella, which is called Great White Limo. So here we go. I had been married for 33 years when COVID began to change lives, and ours was no exception. While my husband proceeded to deepen his relationship with alcohol, passing out in his lazy boy by seven every evening, I found a new and arguably just as dangerous interest, chatting online. At first I used it as a research tool. Well, that's what I told myself. It made sense since I taught psychology at a small community college in Florida. But soon I found myself making friends, good friends, friends with benefits. There was a particular fellow who I found to be a good match. He was intelligent, accomplished, had a great sense of humor, an attentive husband and father who, like myself, was missing the passion he had once enjoyed with his spouse. Steve lived in Richmond Hill, just a two hour drive from my hometown, a town and a country I'd been unable to visit because of COVID. A couple months into our tenuous relationship, we began to ask, what if, what if after this pandemic, I returned to Ontario and we decided to meet? Would it be a friendly hug, then lunch, a few laughs, maybe a kiss goodbye? Or would we cross that proverbial line? The virtual back and forth had been hot. The way he whispered, the things he said he would do to me, things my husband didn't want to do. It was thrilling to think about a face-to-face -face being a real possibility. The months ticked by with every week or so punctuated by a late night text from him, accompanied by a notably artful photograph. One delicate iridescent drop slipping from the slit in his soft pink tip, coaxed from the compression of his hand around his shaft. I never got tired of looking at it. I wanted to frame it. And then finally, the Canadian travel restrictions lifted and in May of the following year, I was on my way back to Ontario and to my familiar pattern, bunking with my childhood chum, B, in her lovingly restored early 1900s four square home on Lock Street, teaching summer session online. And the what if became a now how. It's not a good idea, Shannon, B said as we finished our morning coffee. Not only are you both married, but this what's his name could be another Ted Bundy. You binge watch forensic files. Haven't you learned anything? I guarantee he's not a Ted Bundy, I said, rolling my eyes. And his name is Steve Smith. I walked my coffee cup to the sink, rinsed it, and set it on the ledge under the window. How many times do I have to tell you that? Oh, gee, Steve Smith. How could I forget? She smirked and handed me her cup so I could clean it for her. Okay, I'm off, she added, heading out the back door for work, leaving me to prepare for class. Then she spun around and came back. I almost forgot the egg salad, I said, completing the sentence, passing her the sandwiches wrapped in a brown paper lunch bag. Thanks, friend, she said. Wouldn't want to have to come back here in the middle of the day and surprise you, eh? but it was she who would have been surprised. Up until that year, my summer days at Bees had been relatively uneventful. I'd work in the morning and watch the clock in the late afternoon, anxious for her to get home so the fun could start. Fear-infused golf, mostly, followed by some bar hopping. There were three in town, including the Legion, and then dinner at home and late night TV in our separate bedrooms. This year, however, I wasn't waiting for her. I was waiting, and breathlessly so, for him. As soon as my three-hour lecture on abnormal sight concluded, I'd lock both doors, then call Steve. We'd spend lunchtime together with our pants down around our respective ankles, jacking and jilling off. And after the dust settled, arranging the tricky particulars of our impending rendezvous. 
I was happy when he agreed a hotel room would be too risky and too high pressure. There's a bed in there for God's sake. And it couldn't be anywhere we might be recognized. So we decided to meet at a truck stop on a lonely highway northwest of Toronto. We'd have a beer and a bite to eat and see where it led. Perhaps to the back of his king cab? Perhaps not. But when I pitched the plan to my bestie, she shot it down and recommended a far more creative alternative. He was the accountant for the Great White Limo Service, headquartered in our tiny town. If I was damned and determined to go through with the meetup, she suggested I surprise Steve with a limo ride that she would arrange and at a deep discount. No drinking and driving and no prying eyes. And if we wanted to take it all the way to Boomtown, which of course she advised against, there was plenty of room in there to get busy. Who's going to drive? I asked, concerned. Obviously, it can't be anyone who knows me, and everyone around here does. We got a new kid who commutes from St. Catharines, he said. Remember our old chauffeur, Albert? It's his grandson. Lawrence doesn't know anyone here. And besides, it's none of his damn business what goes on in the limo. If he does anything unprofessional, I want to hear about it. Stay tuned for part two of Great White Limo.